Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duarte. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Team Tuesday this week with Mirella Moose. Hey, Mirella, welcome back. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. So, Mirella, on Tuesdays, we talk about teams, and we'll get to that in a minute, but we also want a resource, a source of inspiration. What was for you the book that most inspired you in your role as a product owner? I don't think I have one book specifically. The the ones I found memorable in in the last few years would be Competing Against Luck uh, from Clayton Christensen. Um, most lots of corporate stories so if you're a startup just focus on the jobs to be done methodology there are also a few other places you can read about it it's just such a powerful concept that helped me in many client engagements to cut through a lot of noise uh, and another one would be thinking in systems which is it's not a product book uh, but again it has helped me navigate a lot of organizations and understanding incentives or a lot of reasons things happen is because of the system man, <laughs> which is also like one of what our PM uh, complained about when something was not going that well at the client. Uh, it, it seemed like the whole setup was wrong. And of course, then that started crashing here and there. M maybe the third I can think of is the UDA loop. Uh, it's, it's also that has a nice Wikipedia article is uh, observe, orient, decide, act. Uh, from a military strategist, uh, basically, you can apply that to even solving your hunger for lunch. Uh, but you can, in any concept, just stopping and observing, orienting yourself, deciding, and then acting. Absolutely. And and this order loop is actually something that follow straight from understanding systems, right? Like systems are not things that you can just go and start playing. You have to go and understand not everything, because there's, you know, potentially not even everything can be understood, but you have to understand, create the theory, and then act on it, measure the feedback, and then learn from that, right? Yes. And uh, when we think about teams, because today is Tuesday, we are going to mm -hmm. think about teams. We, we also very often think about systems. Now, they can be outside the team systems, but sometimes even internal systems within the team can lead to some patterns or behaviors that ultimately make it hard for you to do your job as a product owner. So tell us one of those stories, Mirala. Tell us a little bit about the context so that we know more or less what kind of team we're talking about. And then walk us through how that pattern or behavior developed over time that ultimately led to problems. Sure. So one of the things we've seen is definitely systemic topics, but those would be too large to uh, describe. Um, and there was a quote from Y Combinator where it says that you're most likely to die by suicide than murder. Um, referring to also founders being a bit too obsessed with the competition or people looking too much at the competition rather than looking internally what is working and what is not and what you can do better. Same thing. So one would be the structural aspect. Uh, the other part could be wrong people at the wrong time in the setup. Uh, or or just cultural or ways of working differences. Maybe the the more sim so I think we addressed on Monday the the parts with ways of working misalignment. Other things we've seen um, even sometimes at bigger companies where I was expecting a stronger HR uh, or people focus that would weed out toxic personalities. These do tend to appear quite often in tech, especially in development teams, as the last 10 years have always left companies to believe there aren't any developers available. So we can, if we can just take this person and if we just have this person here, yes, they're very difficult, they're very hard to work with, but hey, we need people and we need developers. That, that has led sometimes with uh, this type of personalities making life harder sometimes for everyone, but very often for the product owner, product manager. 
So at one of these publicly listed companies uh, that that we were helping, there there was someone that was acting incredibly difficult to the point that when I started the engagement, I was warned about that person from a director level. Of course, in very corporate terms, um, in a sense that someone um, needs to improve a bit their way of communicating uh, because it's going to hurt their career uh, progression here and so on. But for me, that person was a clear firing just from the disruption they brought to the team. Uh, so one way to work around that was to sometimes just pretend the person is not there because we would have an update in the standup and the person would interrupt everyone and say, this is not interesting for me or pertaining to what I'm working on, I will leave. But there were, we were the same team and it was a relatively uh, small five, six people team at the time. Uh, then I was giving an update on our shared uh, channel on what things are happening. And then this person would comment, but this is not interesting to me. So, so, so there were a lot of, um, or, or, or more was like, how is this interesting to me? And then I need to explain, well, this could impact this or it could impact that. To some degree, it made me also conscious, like each time I'm going to say or post something, this person is going to have a potential reaction that may not be very pleasant. Um, and, and I've heard it also happen in a few places. So even in larger companies, I've heard PM saying, hey, I'm having trouble wanting to open my laptop in the morning because I need to deal with this team or with like some people from that team. Uh, so it, it's a bit more common than we would like it to. I got lucky at some point, there was a request from another team of staffing. And somehow it happened that this person was the, the best for that a specific um, part. And since they were anyway very uncollaborative of joining standups and all of that, they were then excused from joining our internal meetings, which made things more peaceful and quiet and, and easier to work with. Uh, but it was uh, a bit of a challenge. Um, and it didn't feel like it solved itself over time. It was more that... Um, People just worked around that person rather with them. And it, I've seen it also happen with leadership and not necessarily C-level or founder level, but even sometimes mid-management where the whole team ends up working around the person and figuring out how to minimize the disruption from this person rather than just dealing with the problem head, heads on. Um, I did also notice it in our companies. We've had some people who didn't like us and didn't want to be there, but for whatever reason, they were staying with the company and we had to have a few conversations to not not have uh, this continue. But it took us a while to understand observing this and observing it internally when someone, regardless of how well they perform, they're just so much more disruptive uh, that is is really not worth it for for the rest so, of the team. So uh, when when you think about this, so I, I'm I'm sure that everyone listening to this has been in a team where there's some level of disruption, right? Like, you know, disruption is kind of a spectrum as well. Like there's a little bit of disruption every now and then, and there's the everyday disruption. Of course, and, 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 and sometimes so you also need tension, right? This is also the exactly, PM because it's... and PM um, du uh, dual. You always need that someone who um, forces that balance themselves. So I'm, I'm not saying about that. I'm not just saying about, you know, challenge when challenges should be had uh, or question that or disagree and commit or oppose. Uh, I'm just highlighting uncollaborative and toxic behavior. Can that be passive aggressive or just aggressive? Uh, but I think it's kind of you know it when you see it type, right? You, yeah. you don't and need to. So in in and because you've had this experience, uh, you, you have developed your approaches to this. So so let let's talk to the product owners and scrum masters out there. If they are right now facing such a situation, what could be one, two, or three steps that we could take to try to address it? Now, mm -hmm. it's not guaranteed because people are complex. So, but give us some ideas. What, where could we start? Some ideas assume good intentions, right? Because one of the things that I realized that that person's behavior was undermining my performance if I would have left it, right? So you need to fight with yourself and then communicate transparently, do as you would do in a team that likes you and is very helpful and supportive, you know, because otherwise you end up um, maybe even attacking this person then that they put you in a bad light because they've triggered you. So first assume good intentions, assume the person just, I don't know, has a bad day or week or month and so on and, and carry on as you would do in a proper setup. Uh, then the second, if 
if you see that this continues to some degree, uh, have a one-on-one and give them feedback separately and say, um, you don't know the whole non-violent communication approach. I have observed this and that. This made me feel this way. What, what is your opinion? Like, how can we do uh, better? We've noticed sometimes this disarms people um, in, in a sense that they stop attacking. Um, of course, uh, while you do that, have continue with open communication. So if these people give you passive aggressive comments or negative comments in a public Slack channel or in like some Google Doc or somewhere, then this can also build up a bit over time towards your case. Uh, so, so one thing we noticed with uh, someone who was having trouble with a designer is that this designer was being difficult to them only in one-on-one calls or in DMs. And what I advise my PM is like, I can't do anything with your DMs. Please uh, follow our best processes and discuss this in open channels. And and if they commit, there were also some cases where, let's say, the person commits to something, then they don't do it, and they, they say they never committed to that, right? So that is also then difficult to address if you don't have something more than what this person said in a call or in a DM, because it's a bit tacky to then screenshot their DMs and send it elsewhere, right? But Yeah, also you, it's easy to fake, right? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, if, if you start going around that, then it's probably the company has way bigger problems. It's like someone exactly. can't admit and it, it is well, One of the things that you said is actually very important, like have policies around what is shared or public communication, right? Of course, these days of remote work, having something on the team Slack or whatever team uh, chat or uh, email with more people involved or or in an online meeting, uh, because the one-on-ones are very good because they establish a certain level of trust. But because they do that, that means that they know that nothing is going to get out, right? Like, and And you talked about the commitments, right? Like maybe somebody committed to something one-on-one, but then said, I've never committed to that. And and this is a great example of how the Scrum Master and the product owner can work together to bring up behaviors in the mm-hmm. public public channels, as you called it, right? Yeah, so uh, de- defaulting to public communication uh, is, is also a policy that we Im- try to enforce as much as we can at Product People. Of course, if it's not something like you make lunch plans with someone or discussing sensitive performance topics, because of course you can't like go advertise as like a hey, X is on a performance improvement plan or they just got a uh, they just got a warning. Um, and although employees have requested that and they said, well, this is not a group chat and it can actually hinder the um, likelihood of this person improving because people would just mark them as uh, okay. The, you know that they already flagged them under a negative um, tag. So. Um, I, I think it's in general that defaulting to uh, open communication that's more visible to more people than it should be visible, uh, unless you're working with like super sensitive data or you are in an adversarial environment, like trying to prevent fraud. Of course, you should make your, your fraud internal policies. Uh, so, so there are, of course, limits to my advice. In, in general, it has proven to work very well for us, also as a time saver, because then People can see what we're discussing. Let's say if we are, sometimes teams prefer to have a private Slack channel for just the dev team designer and whoever else is involved. If they see us also communicating and talking with the designer, they get a bit more wholesome a sense of how this other part works. They don't just see like a design popping up and questioning, right? And if you have these threads there and share outcomes from um, user interviews or other things, I know this sometimes it gives developers also a bit more empathy uh, that they see the work being done. I feel that sometimes they could comment or ask questions there and saying, well, but, uh, you know, if someone can't come in and complain very late that this thing we want to do is not in the design system or doesn't work like that, I say, well, you also had access to that. You you were also given the Figma link to whom comment. Uh, it it gives a bit more buy-in and accountability over time if people get the sense of transparency and and also the option to give feedback uh, or being explained why they're getting a no for their suggestion. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and that's just a, a couple of good ideas. And uh, I'm sure we could uh, go on and, and uh, investigate more, but it's really, really important to address this. Uh, what you call toxic personalities or lack of collaboration 
from certain team members. Uh, thank you for sharing that story, Mirala. Always. Tuesday is team day here on the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. But tomorrow we talk about something that goes beyond the work we do with the teams. We will talk about how to lead change and what our guests have learned from leading and participating in change programs during their career. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.